in tonight's Motor Week, the designer behind the new Land Rover Freelander, the voice-activated car, and what to do when your life turns upside down. Well, let me give you a little history lesson. A few years ago, when I asked Volvo why they didn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle, they said, well, oh, four-wheel drive, we're not convinced. We think two-wheel drive on a properly engineered car is as good a bet as four-wheel drive a la Audi. Well, things have changed since then because Volvo has since decided that uh, a four-wheel drive car is not a bad idea indeed. And what's more, they've gone one step further by having launched their V70 all-wheel drive, AWD. They've now gone for this, something they're just about to launch in the UK, called the Volvo V70 all-wheel drive cross-country. What it is effectively is a, a car that mm, kind of looks like an off-roader, but is actually not an off-roader. It's a car for on-road use predominantly, on-road use for 99.9% .9 of its life. And the four-wheel drive facility is not there to go mud plugging or driving through rivers. It's there really to, uh, to ensure that you're safe on those icy roads at night and to give you that extra traction. It's a very sophisticated system. Most of the time you've got 95% or thereabouts of the drive going to your front wheels and 5% drive to the back wheels. But depending on what sort of surface you hit, in fact you might even be hitting two surfaces at the same time. You might for example have gravel on, on two wheels on one side of the car and tarmac or snow or whatever on the other side. Uh, depending on whatever road conditions you happen to stumble across, the car then decides for you exactly what you need. It's almost like driving a luxury limousine come off-roader. You know, there are better cars off-road than this for obvious reasons, but there aren't too many cars in this league that drive like a limousine and have the performance of this V70 all-wheel drive cross-country. They've got to do something about that name, it's far too long. The physical difference between the standard V70 all-wheel drive and the cross-country version is that the cross-country has 16-inch alloy wheels, increased ground clearance, uh, front bumpers with overriders, has a new style grille, grey side mouldings, a retractable rear bumper dust cover, partial colour keyed rear bumpers, new style roof rails with crossbars, canvas and leather upholstery in grey or oak, these amazing little uh, floor mats that should uh, cope with the mud and w water that you'll be lugging into the car and side nets at the rear to protect those, uh, those awkward loads from flying around. It has that same 2.5 litre, five cylinder, light pressure, high performance engine. The first thing I have to admit is that we've broken all the rules. We've taken the car off road. Well, they told us not to go off-road. They told us it wasn't an off-roader. It's the vehicle that looks like an off-roader, but is actually for on-road use only. But you know what we're like. We had to break the rules. We've taken the thing off-road. We've been up some pretty uh, hilly, flinty roads. We've been through some streams. We've been through some mud. And I've got to say, there's never any danger of getting stuck. We weren't terribly adventurous where we went. We wouldn't go anywhere that you would go in, a, I don't know, a Jeep Cherokee or a Jeep Grand Cherokee or Wrangler come to that. Uh, and I'm afraid we've got a few casualties along the way. These are bits that have fallen off the uh, Volvo V70 cross country. That's the bad news. The good news is they're all bits designed to fall off. These are, these are bits that you might take off the car when you're towing or whatever. So they just be, need to be slotted in. We'll do away with those for the time being, I think, don't you? Uh, but I think it says, it says a lot for the car that it's done what we expected it to do and more.
don't buy this car, don't even think about this car if you want to go into serious off-roading. If that's your bag, stick with something like a Range Rover or a, or a Jeep, because this is really the car for on-road use that might be used for 1% of its life, you know, going into a muddy field to pull out a horse box, to pull out a boat down on the farm, that sort of thing. The four-wheel drive facility, we can't stress this often enough, the four-wheel drive facility is when you're on a tarmac road in winter, when there's that black ice or sheet ice that might be there that you might not even see. That's when the Volvo V70 all-wheel drive cross-country, probably the car with the longest name in the world, comes into its own. Phone dial 555-1212. Phone dial 555-1212. Radio Tune 101.1. Radio Tune 101.1 FM. It's a breakthrough technology, a voice-activated control system for your car. And get this, you don't have to pre-program it, and it responds to any driver's voice. Unlike other voice recognition technologies, this Visteon system doesn't need to learn your voice first. You simply think about what you want to say, and you say it, it's natural, it's continuous, and the car listens and responds to your voice command. And how do you do that? Press a button on the steering wheel, speak, and instantly CD control play, things such Eagles. as a CD player. Mini disc play. The Eagles. Set the temperature inside the car. Climate control, max AC. Climate control, max AC. Or even ask directions. 16800, Executive Plaza Drive. In a half mile, make a right turn. And all this time, Volume you're keeping three. your eyes on the road instead of the Volume buttons. Up. We've been working on it for five or six years. We realize that it's really necessary for safety of the person using the kind of instrumentation there is in a vehicle of the future. Upcoming enhancements even include an online internet web browser for such things as the latest satellite weather. In Honolulu, expect partly cloudy skies with periods of sunshine. Or stock reports. This technology is available today, and it'll be on the Buy road in 1999. With speculation and rumour rife over the future of Rolls-Royce Motors, we've been looking into the facts as they stand at time of recording. Vickers, who currently own Rolls-Royce Motors, announced two weeks ago that they were putting Rolls-Royce up for sale. They believed at the time that the Mayflower Group, who produced MGF bodies for Rover, would make a bid. Although Vickers estimate that Rolls-Royce would require £600 million in investment over the next eight years. We contacted Mayflower, who repeated their statement at the time of Vickers' announcement. We are considering our options. Speculation then grew that BMW, who many see as the most likely suitor for the British mark, were then rumoured to be supporting Mayflower's bid. Speaking to BMW, who were told that Bern Streeter expressed continued interest in buying Rolls-Royce as long as it made financial sense for BMW. However, they went on to say that we have nothing to do with any Mayflower bid. Mercedes and Fiat are rumoured to have expressed interest in buying the company, although only Mercedes have publicly confirmed their interest. Rolls-Royce PLC, who manufacture the aero engines, will be involved in discussions as the Rolls-Royce name and double R logo belong to them. As soon as more details emerged, we'll keep you informed. We've seen the Freelander in the metal at either the Frankfurt or London Motor Shows, and soon Motor Week will be driving it. But what do you think of the styling? We met up with the Freelander's chief designer. The new Freelander is aimed very much at the compact 4x4 
leisure sector of the market. It's a new area of the market for us and what it will do is bring accessibility for people wanting land, the Land Rover mark and the pedigree that comes with that. What this vehicle is doing is giving accessibility to a lot more people that aspire to Land Rover, to the mark, that up until now haven't necessarily been able to afford a Land Rover. We haven't set the pricing yet for Freelander, but it will um, range from um, £15,000 approximately up to £20,000. Freelander is very much a lifestyle product but it's, it's just as comfortable off-road as it is on-road. Um, it doesn't have some of the same characteristics, for example, as, as a Discovery, but then it's not specifically aimed at that area of the market. There are two models. One is the, uh, the three-door, um, which has a hardback option or a softback. Um, one of the interesting things about the three-door is the reconfigurability of, uh, of the vehicle. The softback, for example, can be stowed forward onto the header and that combined with the removable um, roof panels gives you a very open, sporty type vehicle. The five-door, on the other hand, is very much a family-orientated vehicle with optimization of interior stowage. When you look at the vehicle, you'll find all sorts of stowage areas at the front of the uh, vehicle in terms of, of stowage bins on the doors, glove boxes, um, stowage areas in the rear quarter panels and at the rear and even up on, the, on, on the, the headlining with things like the net pockets which are traditional Land Rover cues but sunglass holders all types of very carefully thought out um, detailing. Dynamically it, it's a great car to drive and of course you have this sort of added value of, of sitting relatively high which is very much a Land Rover cue with this authoritative um, command driving position and you see this very nice bonnet in front of you which again is is one of the Land Rover cues and as you walk round the vehicle although it's very contemporary in its design execution you will see there are lots of touches which confirm its 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 pedigree as a as a Land Rover the interesting thing about Freelander is this unique combination of on-road refinement and on-road dynamics combined with its, its very capable ability off-road. That's a, a unique proposition um, and it, it was de designed very much from the outset as a, a Land Rover product and if you were to compare it with the competition you'll find that most of, the, of that actually is car derived so you don't have the same capabilities. It's very much a car that can be used every day um, on the road and as an everyday vehicle and it's super and I love it and I want to buy one. <laughs> we, we have been here before, um, I'm talking about glutton for punishment, I have done this exercise with you once before in the summer, uh, you threw me uh, upside down round and round, it was like taking a fairground ride but of course it's a real real danger this isn't it in the real world of motoring. Yeah what we've actually got with the rescue simulator is some form of putting people through what happens in a crash. Now you might think, why do we want to talk about accident and what am I going to teach you that's unique to an Audi Quattro? Well the answer is nothing really unique other than with Quattro your likelihood of the crash is somewhat reduced, but there's an awful lot of other drivers out there. Twenty years ago this wouldn't have been a problem, but today more and more people are surviving very very serious incidents only to do themselves damage getting out of the car. Believe it or not something in the order of 40% of the potential injury takes place after the crash is finished. Hang on let's get that right. 40%? 40%. 40 These injuries are basically back and neck injuries. So somebody survives an impact maybe they're parked on their roof of the car and then the injury occurs after they've trying the to get out of the vehicle because the, the modern passenger car is a very safe environment to have a crash in Audi have taken the bull by the horns and said well look having survived the crash now's the time to have a little bit of knowledge in what to do not to do yourself any further damage the cars on its roof gently spinning down the middle of the road it comes to rest what happens next well, if you've watched any television, any American films, there's always a puff of smoke, 
that huge explosion and a fireball. Well, that's what happens, isn't it? They catch fire. No. The likelihood of fire is less than half of 1%. You have no major rush to get out of the car. Right. As, and of course, in, 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 true, uh, in true fashion, uh, my mobile phone, which is parked over there, has just gone off. Now, I should explain why my mobile phone is over there, because when a car turns upside down, as this one is about to, actually, something like a mobile phone in the car is the equivalent to a house brick in the car. And just ask yourself this question. When you're driving along, would you like to be hit in the face by a house brick? Absolutely not. So why would you want to be hit in the face by a mobile phone like the one on that table over there, which I'm about to answer? Do not touch the seatbelt buckle. Well, that would be your first instinct, wouldn't um, it? Fortunately, it is your first instinct, it's your strongest instinct. It could well be your last instinct. You must give yourself time to think. Sort out what happens next. Don't immediately go for the bottom. You're going to roll that way. You've got everything in the pedal well to catch your feet. Yep. You've got that gap there that you're hoping your hips will slide through very gently. The odds aren't very good. Mm. And your entire body weight is then hanging mm. on whatever catches. Mm. So, take your left hand and put it on the inside of the passenger seat back. Okay. There, that's great. Right. Now then, take your left leg and put it on the passenger's door. Not the glass, anywhere on the door. This is your first motoring aerobics program. Here we go. Right. How about there? That's fine. If you've got a passenger, they would do well to take your leg and put it on the door, because if you don't, I guarantee where you'll put it. Yeah. Now, the only trick to this is you're going to open your seat belt with your right hand, which is something you've probably not done since you stopped courting. <laughs> the difficult part is finding it. So find the cross strap and follow it round to the buckle. Okay. Now, this is very, very important, which we will come back to later. All right. Now then, push with your foot, push with your hand, and take the weight off the belt. At that point, release it. Yep. The split second it releases, put that hand back on the steering wheel. Okay. People are absolutely incensed because the belt won't retract, and they fiddle with it. You want your hand back on there, okay. you're stabilised. The only mistake you can make is use the wrong hand to open the seat belt. Make sure that you're braced before you release the belt. So we're imagining that we've been going down a country lane, I've done something very silly, I've put the car on the passenger side. On, the, on your on the high side. Right. And just sit tight and I'll meet you around the other side. Right Mike, left hand on the inside of that seat, left leg down on this door panel. Oh, that hurts the sort of pelvic area, I can tell you. Right. Okay, that's better. Right hand, find the seat belt. Uh, say that again, Bob. Right hand, find that seat belt. Right. Follow it round. I'm feeling pretty disorientated. Push, take the weight, release, grab the wheel. Oh, that's better. Forget that belt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Leg down onto the door. Woof. At this point, you're now stable. You don't realise how wide a car is, do you? It's, it's almost as... I'm almost as tall as the car is wide. It's a long way there. Now, now hang get on a rid Mitch. of the belt at this point. Should I? This is an interesting thought. If I'd have stood up then and that window had still been intact and closed, I would have clunked my head, wouldn't I? Well, you can open it at whichever stage you like. Right. I, I would always suggest you open the car, bef the, the windows, before you do anything else. Right. A, it stops you opening the seat belt. Climb out, sit on the B post. Am I okay to tread on the headrest? Anything rest? at all. These are well built, these German cars, I'll tell you. See, this car's been doing this for two years and it's really? the same body shell, it's not Good bad God. going. And we've had one or two big boys climb out of there. Now, you, like you say, it's a long way down, isn't it? Yeah, so you want your feet this side. Okay. Get your bearings now. Can I sit on the door? Yeah. Okay. Your best way is come down this B post okay. so you don't fall back in the car. And then Keep slide your down? your right hand on that door yeah. and get to the floor. How you do it from there doesn't matter. Now. Okay, well I guess I'll just kind of slide down. Sliding is your best bet. Ugh. Now then, you jumped off. The one thing I don't want you to do. You told me that. Not You're assuming that. this car's going to be stable. Yeah. Audi have done their bit, they've built you a safe environment. I know what you're going to say. You've done your bit, 
you've climbed down. I know what you're going to say. Invariably, you'll go down on your knees and say, done it, and two and a half tonne of car rolls on top it of you. Rolls on top of you. If you only keep your hand there, you know what it's doing. Then Mike Rutherford discovered, to his horror, that this week was a rollover week. You're feeling your head in the headline. Yeah, I am indeed. The actual weight that's taking off your body is ounces. Don't be fooled into thinking, well, I'm touching the headlining, I can now afford to press the belt. You can't. Yep. So, bring your feet up onto the dashboard. Right. Ah. Oh. This hand behind your head. That feels better already. Now then, pull your head forward, let go of the steering wheel. Like that? Yes, now push with your feet. Okay. See, you're trying to use your hands. You can't use that hand. Got it. You've got to keep that head there. Yep. That's where you're going. It's, it's putting an awful lot of pressure on my thighs, on my pelvis, on my neck. It's extremely uncomfortable, and this is safe. There's no, there's no blood and guts and broken glass. And I tell you, I feel kind of scared almost. But you must remember that that's the piece yep. you're coming for. Yep. And it's at that point you consider getting in. Well, okay, I'm going to go the whole hole. Right, hold on. I'm going to give you a hand on this. I'm going to put the microphone down and check everything's correct. Okay. Whoa. Jesus. Whoa. But I tell you, Onto it's not very nice. Knees. But it's about a thousand times better than doing it the wrong way, which is to fall on your neck and break it. And out you come. I tell you. That should be taught to every school kid in Britain. It should be taught to every adult in Britain. It should be available on the National Health Service and it should be as important now, as anything you do in life. If you learn how to drive properly in the first place on an Audi course or whatever course you're doing, hopefully you'll never put the car on the roof to begin with. It's a bit like the skid scenario. How do you control a skid? I'll tell you how you control a skid. You don't get into a skid in the first place. How do you get out of a car once it's been turned over? Well, don't put the car on the roof. You'll never have to find out for yourself, thank God. Next week, technology gone bananas, your own car computer. The Nissan Skyline for the lucky 100. And is the Passat estate as excellent as the saloon? Next week on Motor Week.